for tapes, CDs, DVDs, or our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, Zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Wednesday afternoon, December the 27th, 1978. Lake Hamilton Bible Camp Midwinter Camp Meeting being held in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Frank Hammond is a speaker of the afternoon. Thank the Lord. It's good to be here. It's taken us several years to get here, but uh, <laughs> praise the Lord, here we are. We rejoice in the Lord. I trust today that, that all of us will come to a better appreciation for the ministry of deli- deliverance. You know, I still find a few people that do not appreciate the ministry of deliverance. Can you believe that? But you must not be in that crowd or else you wouldn't be here for this emphasis. But I believe even us who do appreciate it can come to appreciate it even more. Would you indulge me just to share a little bit of personal testimony? A lot of people look at me and say, well, who is he? Where did he come from? And try to guess what my background might have been. So I will uh, relieve you of a lot of that guesswork by just sharing a few details. Not that they're so important, but... Because God is, is touching the lives of many people, many different ministers from all kinds of backgrounds. God's just doing a thing in this hour, and He's really pouring out His Spirit and putting things together. I'm thankful that I was raised in a Christian home. My father was a Baptist deacon and treasurer of the church that I grew up in for about 35 years. So I came from that kind of a heritage. I was brought up in all of the curriculum and activities of the Baptist faith. And when I was 26 years of age, the Lord called me into ministry, and I pastored Southern Baptist churches in Texas for about 19 years. And uh, in spite of the fact that the last uh, church that I pastored was a good church in, in the judgment of men, it was a growing church. We had building programs, and for a lot of people, you know, that's the criteria. You know, if you're having building programs, you're having a successful ministry. But I found out that is not necessarily true. And in the midst of a, of a growing church situation, I found myself very dissatisfied with spiritual results and accomplishments in my own life and in the church. And I began to pray for revival. I tell you, that's a dangerous prayer to pray. <laughs> if you don't really mean it, you better not pray it. Because when God sends revival, He doesn't always send it in the old format. Sometimes He has a whole completely new way of bringing what we're asking for. When I started praying for revival, I had never heard of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I'd heard a few people spoke in tongues, but I knew that they were all emotionally upset and fanatics and this thing and the other. And, of course, I'd completely dismissed that from my recollection because that didn't apply to me at all. And so I prayed that prayer for two and a half years. I fervently and consistently prayed, Lord, I need a revival. How can I help a church if I'm not revived myself? Well, I look back and I can see how God was beginning to lay some roads in my life to answer the prayer that I was praying. But God being gracious and merciful, He knew that if He had given me instantly what I'd asked for, that it would have just completely inundated me and I wouldn't have been good for anything because He wanted to give me the power of the Holy Spirit and I wasn't in any condition to receive it. The two great hindrances that I had to overcome in order to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit was pride, mainly Baptist pride, denominational pride, religious pride, and fear. Fear of man. The fear of man bringeth a snare. And those two great hindrances had to be removed out of my life methodically as God ground me down so far that I didn't have anything to be proud of and I was so desperate that I wasn't scared of anything. So God knows how to do it. And so He began to do it. After we received the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and I say we because God baptized my wife and I and our teenage daughter at that time, in the Spirit, and that's been 11 years ago. And I tell you, that was a turning point in my life. I wouldn't take anything for what has transpired in the past 11 years. It's been exciting to tell you about it, but also it has been fruitful. And after all, that's the most meaningful part, isn't it? When you can begin to have a fruitful ministry. And just as God brought me into the baptism of the Holy Spirit, He introduced me to... Now, I always believed that there was a, a, a devil... But I never had paid much attention to evil spirits and demons as they're spoken of in the Scripture. So God began to unveil my understanding concerning these things. Have you found sometimes that when God begins to open up something to you that you just put up a little resistant wall there and say, that's fine, Lord, that's all right for somebody else, but I don't care to get involved in that? 
Well, that's the way I was when I, when I first heard about demons and deliverance. That sounded like a messy thing to me. And I really didn't care a whole lot about getting directly involved in it. But God has a way of saying, tag, you're it, you know. So He put the tag on me. And uh, for a long time, I used to sort of boast about the fact how God drug me into the ministry of deliverance. And then God got me straightened on that. He says, it is a calling. And anything that the Lord calls you into, you can be thankful for that God has given you the privilege to be a part of. So I'm thankful today that deliverance ministry is a part of that in which God has called me. Like Brother Wynn said this morning, my main ministry is as a pastor. In fact, I get the feeling just a little bit rusty about ministering deliverance between uh, times as I go out and teach on it because when I'm home, we do not have that concentrated uh, uh, emphasis on the ministry of deliverance. We teach and minister in many other facets of the truth of God's Word. God showed me that it was important for me to have a balance in my ministry. And I found out that I began to get unbalanced in some ways. And so God has helped me to find more of a balance. Now, as, as God brought me into this ministry, I began to see things happen that I hadn't seen before. You know, I, I'm amazed. I, I have trouble understanding some people how they can sit and see a miracle and just sit there passively like a bump on a log like nothing happened. I don't understand people that can be in the midst of supernatural working and, and just like blah, you know. I tell you, when I began to see the supernatural, see God perform miracles, began to see and to understand the authority that a believer has over evil spirits, that he can command evil spirits in the name of Jesus and they will obey him, that got my attention. I wanted to know more about it. I wanted to get more involved in it. When I began to see the fruits of the ministry of deliverance, when I began to see people that had had problems, long-standing problems, actually come into victory over those problems, that got my attention. One of the first uh, 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 ministries that I got into deliverance was with another Baptist preacher. And he had had a physical problem for about 16 years. He had been injured. He had had a severe head injury. And he had had constant pain in his body for all those years. Can you imagine having a constant headache for 16 years? No relief from it day or night. He could not sleep properly. He could not relate to other people properly. His family was in shambles because of the pain that he had and the resultant nervousness and tension that that produced in his own body. When I found out God healed people, I said, Bro, I'm going to pray for you until God heals you. And so I began to pray diligently each day. And I tried to pray for about a week. God told me, He said, Well, his problem is that he has demons. And you know, I thought, how am I going to tell that Baptist preacher he's got demons? <laughs> and I thought about that for a while and prayed some more. And God says, you go tell him. And I said, well, he's my friend, Lord. I don't want to lose my friend. He said, you go tell him. So when I went and told him, he said, uh, well, praise God. He said, doesn't the Bible say you can cast those things out? He said, I want you to cast it out of me. And I said, wait a minute. <laughs> I said, God just gave me the understanding. I don't know anything, but we'll pray and see who God would have us to go to for this ministry. But I didn't know any deliverance ministers. See, I, I just had the baptism a few weeks, and I didn't know, I didn't have much, much anybody to talk with about these things. So I'd go back and I'd pray. And the strangest thing, when I'd pray, God would say, you do it. I'd say, God, where can I go? And God said, you do it. I sounded worse than Moses at the burning bush, making excuses as to why I couldn't go do it. But God says, you go do it. So we set up a meeting. He and his wife and my, my wife and I, we got the four of us got together. And we had, we called it a prayer meeting. We didn't know what else to call it. So we called it a prayer meeting and we challenged a spirit. We had some manifestation. But his headache really wasn't cured. But we learned a little more over the next few months. And ultimately we ministered to that brother again. And the spirit began to name itself. It began to speak through him. And it identified itself. As his face was contorted, it looked hideous. His face was twisted out of shape, and there was the expression of pain in his countenance, and that spirit said, pain was his name. We said, sure, that makes sense, spirit of pain. <laughs> so we cast out the spirit of pain, and you know he never had any more headaches? He had not until this day. He hasn't had any more headaches, the spirit of pain. Now, that got my attention. And I began to see other things. I began to see and listen to these spirits as they would speak through people, but more to see the results after deliverance and see people set free from bondages and problems and difficulties that they had carried for many years, even as Christians, that had never gotten the victory. I've seen people that have had problems 
and they have prayed over them. They, they've, they've sought God in every way. They have prayed and fasted together and so on, but they have never come into the victory except when that was coupled with the ministry of deliverance. So that began to get my attention. I began to say, now I'm not painting a picture to you today that deliverance is an instant cure-all for all problems, but it is a part of what the Lord is doing. God is restoring the body of Christ today. God is restoring a lot of things in the church that have been missing. A big segment of the church has not known about the power of God's Holy Spirit. A lot of the church has not even known about praise and how to really praise and how to worship God. God is restoring us today to a practical righteousness and holiness to live before Him. And part of what God is putting in the body of Christ today is deliverance ministry. It belongs in the local church. We don't need a bunch of vagabond exorcists running all over the country casting out devils. Now, Brother Wynn and some of us are in a ministry of going out and teaching in order that we can get these ministries where they belong. They need to be in the church. If you need salvation, if you need the baptism in the Holy Spirit, if you need prayers for healing, if you need deliverance, you ought to be able to find it in the local expression of the church. And that's my conviction of where it ought to be. You know what God told me this morning while Brother Wynn was ministering? He told me that the main emphasis in this camp is training God's army. And I believe that. I believe we're here for some personal ministry, but I believe there's a deeper meaning, there's a deeper purpose in our being here, and that is that we are the army of God, and as such, the Lord is training us and preparing us to be the soldiers that He's called us to be. Now, let's come to appreciate more the ministry of deliverance so that we will all participate in it. We'll not be spectators, and we'll not just be those who are the recipients of the blessings of this ministry, but we will actually begin to participate in the warfare much more than we ever have. Now, I want to give you several things this afternoon to help you to appreciate more the ministry of deliverance. I believe we're going to understand and appreciate this ministry like we ought to. We have to have in our minds and in our hearts a real understanding of the two opposing kingdoms. Satan is the head of a kingdom, just as Jesus is the head of the kingdom. Let's turn to John chapter 8. John chapter 8 and read a few verses beginning in verse 30. You see, it is Jesus who offers us deliverance from bondage. And all men have come under the bondage of sin. All of us here today at one time or another have been under the bondage of sin and we've needed deliverance. Listen to what Jesus is saying, John 8 verse 30. And he spake these words, as he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Jesus is looking for disciples today. More than a believer, he wants a follower. He wants one who will continue to learn, one who will continue to grow and to, to develop in the ways of the Lord. So he says, if you really want to be my disciple, continue in my word. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, it's easy to say praise the Lord to that verse. Until we remember that sometimes the truth is hard to swallow. It was amen, it's a little bit weak. Sometimes the truth is a little bit difficult to swallow. I found out as I have moved on in the things and opened myself up to be teachable, that the Lord has said some things to me that were at first very repelling to me. that ever happened to you? You know, here in the same Gospel of John, Jesus was teaching and He was saying to people one day, He says, you have to actually eat my flesh and drink my blood. And the Jews that heard that were repelled by that. They were repulsed and they said, that's a hard thing, Lord. Who can receive it? And it said from that time on that many of them left Him and walked no more with Him. It was a hard thing. Now, I say that to sober you. It's easy to say, Lord, I, I just want Your truth. Lord, I just want to embrace all Your truth because when I embrace Your truth, then I'm going to be set free. That's true. But you need to realize that the Lord may have some things to say to you that are hard to receive. Like it was mentioned today, that people who have been involved in the Masonic Lodge are in, involved in a facet of the Satanic Kingdom. I remember when I first began to teach along that line, I was in a big camp and I, I brought that out in the teaching. And man, at the end of the class, I was just swarmed. 
Here were several men and women around me saying, Brother Frank, did you mean it? Why did you say that? You know, and some of them were offended and some of them were curious and some of them were hungry, had all different kinds. Some of them were, were laborers in the camp. Some of them were there, there to help as counselors in the deliverance ministry. Well, as they learned the truth and received the truth, they were set free from those bondages. See, there are a lot of things like that. And you're going to be hearing some more of them during this conference. So make up your mind that you'll be teachable. That when the truth comes forth, you will embrace it because it's the truth that sets you free. And if we're going to come into the kingdom of God and enjoy the fruits of that kingdom of its righteousness, peace, and joy, then we've got to receive the way into that kingdom. We've got to receive the way into that freedom and release from bondage. Know the truth. And the truth will make you free. Verse 33, Then said, they answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? They had poor memories, didn't they? They said, We Israelites have never been in bondage. They forgot about 450 years in Egypt. They forgot the 70 years in Babylon. But you know, a lot of people are still like that. Me need deliverance. Me have an evil spirit. I'm a Christian. Don't you know that? I've never been in bondage. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah? Well, we're going to be finding out a lot of ways that Christians have been in bondage before we get through. Amen. Verse 34, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin. He said, I'll just give you an illustration. You've never been in bondage? Anybody that serves sin becomes the bond slave of that, of that master. So all of us have fallen into that category. That's about what he says, what Paul says in Romans chapter 6, isn't he? And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. A slave can't give you freedom. But Jesus is not a slave to sin. The inheritance is in Him. It's not in the servant. And if Jesus gives you freedom, then you are absolutely free. You are free indeed. So salvation is what the Lord offers us. Now, do you understand that, that as, as people we are made up of three things, body, soul, and spirit? Now, the Lord came to give us salvation in all of those departments. Your first deliverance is the deliverance of your spirit. And this is what takes place when you're saved. Your spirit is set free. God's spirit comes in to make alive, to quicken your human spirit and to indwell your spirit. Now, when one becomes a Christian, does he automatically become delivered and have all other problems in his life settled and solved forever? Do Christians have no problems in their thought life? Do Christians have no problems in their emotions? Do Christians have no problems in their physical body? You say, well, of course they do, Brother Frank. Well, that's what the Scripture means when it says, work out your salvation. Because God has worked in you something. His Spirit is now within you. It's within your spirit. But that presence of God must permeate into every part of your being. The Lord wants your body set free. He wants your soul set free. And by the soul, I'm talking about yourself. I'm talking about your mind, your emotions, and your will. In the Scripture, the concept of the soul is distinct from that which is of the Spirit. Many times we've used those terms interchangeably as though they meant the same thing. But they do not. You have a Spirit which is the capacity to commune with God within you. But you also have a soul within you. And that comprises your basic self-life and personality of mind, emotion, and will. And here's where we're dealing so much with the enemy. Here's where the enemy has infiltrated so much into the life of the believer. Not into the Holy of Holies. Not into that part of him which represents the indwelling place of God's Spirit. But in the outer court, as it were. To be dealing with those spirits in the thought life and in the motions and in the volition and in the physical body. You know, the Scripture says that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The analogy is so perfect. What was the temple like? It had three areas to it. An outer court, a holy place, and a holy of holies. Just as we, as the temple of God, have an outer court, which is our physical body. We have a holy place, which is our soulish area, and we have a holy of holies, which is the Spirit within us. When God came down after the temple and the tabernacle had been constructed and erected, when God's Shekinah glory came down and His Spirit came into that temple, where did it come? It came into the Holy of Holies, into the innermost part of that temple. And that's where God's Spirit dwelt. But God's Spirit there intended to permeate and to influence everything that took place within that temple. 
And so it is with us as we ourselves are the temple of the living God. God's Spirit comes into us, but God wants to set us free in every area of our life. He wants to control. He wants to influence in every part of our being. That's what God has for you. Amen. That's what He has for us. Now, our goal is to be set free. You remember when the children of Israel came out of Egyptian bondage? Do you know that many of the Egyptians died? In the plague, they died when the death angel visited that land. When they went across the Red Sea, and as they crossed, then the Red Sea closed upon the Egyptian army. Do you know that not one Israelite lifted his finger against an Egyptian? Not one Israelite had anything to do with the death of an Egyptian. Because that, that account represents the coming out of the bondage of sin. It represents the process of salvation. And we do not fight the enemy to come into salvation. That's the work of God's grace. But once we get out, you know, after that, all other enemies Israel was responsible for. When they went into Canaan, God says there are giants in that land, there are walled cities in there, but you've got to go forth in the way of the Lord, in the name of the Lord, and God will go before you and drive out these enemies, and the victories will be yours. But you've got to go and set your foot, and then it's yours. You know, that's such a parallel. That's what the Lord says to you. You've got your salvation. You didn't have to fight to get that. But you're going to come into your inheritance now. You're going to come into your Jesus land inheritance and that's for you. God's promised it to you. He's going to let you have it, but you're going to go forward and you're going to participate in it and you're going to drive out the enemy as God goes with you. It's good to know where we are. Isn't it? It's good to know what God requires of us. Let's go to Luke chapter 11. In Luke chapter 11, beginning in verse 14, we have a contrast of two kingdoms. Now, I wanted you to see this passage just for the sake of seeing that these two kingdoms are real Jesus recognized them, and they're brought into contrast one with the other. Luke eleven fourteen. And as he was casting out a devil, and it was dumb, and it came to pass, when the devil was gone out, the dumb spake, and the people wondered. But some of them said, He casteth out devils through Beelzebub, the chief of the devils. And others, tempting him, sought of him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against a house falleth. Here was a man. He was deaf and dumb. Jesus came by, cast out the devil. Now, the people wondered at what had happened. They accused Jesus of doing this by the authority of the devil himself. But Jesus said, this represents the matter of a kingdom. Satan has a kingdom, and his kingdom is not divided. Else, if it were, his house could not stand. Verse 18, if Satan also be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? Again, Jesus refers to the kingdom of Satan. Because he says that I cast out devils through Beelzebub. But if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I with the finger of God cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God is come upon you. Jesus said you have a clear-cut illustration right here before you. A clear-cut example of the operation of the satanic kingdom and the operation of the kingdom of God. They are poles apart. They are diametrically opposed one towards the other. The kingdom of Satan was seen in its operation to bring a man into bondage, into physical bondage in his body, to make him deaf, to make him dumb. He was in bondage. But the kingdom of God came on the scene that day, having greater power than the kingdom of the enemy, and put the man free from the bondage that he was in. Now, that's the purpose. We are a part of the kingdom of God. It is the purpose and the ministry of we as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ to go forward in the kingdom of God and to set free those who have become the slaves of the kingdom of the devil. You see, they're opposed all the way down the line. You need to know how to recognize one kingdom from another. The kingdom of Satan brings darkness. The kingdom of Jesus brings light. The kingdom of Satan brings lies. The kingdom of Jesus brings truth. The kingdom of the devil brings deception. The kingdom of Jesus brings revelation and understanding. The kingdom of the devil brings damnation. The kingdom of Jesus brings salvation. The kingdom of the devil brings bondage. The kingdom of Jesus brings freedom and deliverance from bondage. All right, so we appreciate the ministry of deliverance much more by having a clear-cut understanding that there are two kingdoms and we're a part of one of those kingdoms and these kingdoms are in conflict one with the other. Now, another thing to appreciate the ministry of deliverance 
is to understand that this ministry is for the whole church. The whole church is called to warfare. Not just a few saints. Listen to me. It's not just a few that God has put in a special ministry of teaching and leading in the deliverance ministry, but the whole church is to be in spiritual warfare. You know, all my life I sang a hymn called Onward Christian Soldiers. And I sang that for 45 years and never fought the devil one day. That's the truth. Get up and sing Onward Christian Soldiers. We as good as that, we'd be on dress parade, put on our Sunday best, parade around singing that we were soldiers. But a soldier is not just somebody that's on dress parade. A soldier is somebody who has spiritual weapons, and there's an enemy that is real, not imaginary, but he's real, and that army goes against that foe to defeat it. Now, that's where we are as Christians, folks. We're a part of God's army. Every one of us within the body of Christ are that. You know, I came to the conclusion... That if we are not directly involved in spiritual warfare, we are failing to carry out the commission that the Lord has given. In Matthew 16 and 18, Jesus said, Upon upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus in his ministry only mentioned a couple of times, so far as the scriptural record is concerned, ever mentioned the church. And this is the first one. On this rock I will build my church. What kind of a church is he going to build? A militant church. One that's going to be in alignment against the gates of hell. You know, all the way through the Scripture, the gates of a city represent the place where the elders and rulers of that city met to take counsel and to judge and to make their plans. And that's exactly the meaning, as I see it, of that phrase there, the gates of hell. I used to picture great big walls and gates, and here come the Christians and they batter them down. But he's talking about the strategy of the enemy. As the enemy sits in his gates and he devises all of his means and all of his strategy, how he can conquer the world, how he can defeat the church, how he can overthrow individual Christians. It says that Jesus is raising up a church that the gates of hell, with all of their plans, with all of their strategy, with all of their efforts, they'll not be able to stop that church, but that church is going to go onward in the power and the name of their Lord. And they're going to go on to victory and the devil can't stop it. Hallelujah. I'm glad to be a part of that victorious church and that victorious army. See, if we weren't Christians, we wouldn't need Ephesians 6, where it tells us the armor that a Christian has. It says there's a Christian armor, seven pieces in that armor. Seven is the number of spiritual completeness. He says here is a complete spiritual armor. The reason we need armor is because we're in spiritual conflict, we're in spiritual battle. Do you know that you are? Are you a part of that spiritual battle and conflict? Again, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5, he's talking about that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds. I tell you, we have weapons. They're spiritual weapons. And we wouldn't need them if we're not going to be in warfare. But these are messages to the church. Can you see and appreciate that? These are words to the church. These are words to me and to you. You are to be in direct conflict with the forces of the devil. So we'll appreciate deliverance ministry when we come to understand that. Do you understand that there are levels, we might call them levels, of spiritual warfare? We usually first become aware of the personal level of warfare. What's that devil bugging me? What's his name? How'd he get there? what I do to get rid of him? How'd I get him off my back? And so those of us that have been anywhere in the ministry of deliverance and have experienced any of it, we have usually experienced it in behalf of ourselves. And there is a level of spiritual warfare. The Lord wants us personally and individually to be set free from the enemy. In the fourth chapter of Nehemiah, it talks about the children of Israel when they came back to rebuild Jerusalem and its walls. See, that was a work and a ministry of of restoration. It parallels the restoration that God is bringing in the body of Christ today. But do you know that, that they had a hard time building those walls? Primarily because the enemies around them were harassing. They intimidated them. They said, why, you build that wall, said it's so puny a little old fox jump up on it and it'll fall down. You can't build that wall. There are just too many problems. There are too many difficulties. You can't build that wall. So the enemy came in to taunt, to tease, to harass, to threaten, to do all that they could to keep them. He said, I want you to know that it's not just for your own skin that you're in this thing, but I want you to get up here and fight for your households. Fight for your mothers and your fathers and your brothers and your sisters. Fight for those who are your own. Get in there and fight the battle and win it. I tell you, that word really needs to come forth today. You know where one of the main attacks of the devil is? Against our families. 
The devil knows that if he can get to your family, he can get to the church because the church is made up of families. No wonder we see so many onslaughts against the family today. And no wonder God is bringing forth so much teaching, so much revelation, so much truth today to strengthen the Christian family. Because as the family grows stronger, the enemy really loses ground. Hallelujah. So we're in the fight. Some of you right now are fighting for members of your family. Some are fighting for husbands and wives and children and others within the family. Stay in that fight. Stay in that battle. Know that it's vital. Know that it's imperative that you press on for the victory that you need in your homes. And then there's the battle in the church. Think the devil ever gets in the church? You think he's interested in the church? You know what I've come to believe? I've, begun, I've come to see and believe that the devil assigns emissaries over churches. He just dispatches one, says, okay, get down there. It's your job to bring all the confusion and havoc that you can to destroy the effectiveness of that church. And if you look at churches, you'll find that most of them have a problem. At least one. Most time, more than one. Isn't it? But they'll have at least one accented problem, you know. And it just goes on. Some old churches have had the same problem within that church for over a hundred years. Well, that just tells you what, what the ruler spirit over that little booger is. He's in there just stirring up all that he can to keep that church fighting itself so that he can't fight the devil. Now, that's the reason we need to learn that the, wep that the weapons we have are spiritual weapons and the warfare is a spiritual warfare. Ephesians says we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but a lot of us still do. We still fight one another. The devil gets Christians and family members to fight each other, and then he goes stands behind a tree and laughs at us and says, Look at those idiots over there. They don't know I stirred it up. He stirs it up and then he goes laughs. Time we learn where the problem originates. Time we get back to the devil and begin giving him the battle rather than getting into the flesh and flesh conflict. But we need to learn to fight for one another in the body of Christ. I find God's putting an appreciation for one another in the body of Christ. Amen. Love to hear your amens on that. God's teaching us to respect one another, to honor one another, to love one another, to esteem one another, to help one another. Praise God. He's putting us together. So we're becoming, we're becoming, becoming concerned about those in the body of Christ that need to be liberated, those that need to be set free. And we pitched the level of battle there. But there's a dimension of warfare that I've personally seen very little of it taking place, but we're coming to it. And that's against those principalities and powers, those strong ruler spirits that rule over cities, that rule over nations. See, there's mention of those in the Word of God. It's in the 10th chapter of Daniel. When Daniel prayed and the angel came, Took him 21 days to get there with answer to Daniel's prayer. And he gave the reason for it, that he had encountered a prince ruler, a prince over Greece, prince over Persia. He mentioned those ruler spirits. They're ruler spirits. But you know, God is bringing us to that level of warfare. But he's, he's having to lead us through these other levels of warfare in order that we will be prepared. This is the ministry for the body of Christ. This is the ministry for the church to carry that warfare into that level and to carry it into that plane. And who is responsible? Folks, you're here from various places in the country. You're here from various towns and cities. The Christians in the individual cities where they live are responsible to defeat those spirits in their own locality. That's why God has you there. That's a part of your job, a part of your work, to come against those ruler spirits that are over your town, over your geographical area that you are to win those battles. And so we're going to be entering into those battles. We're going to be encountering the enemy head on in all of those places and in all of those ways. Now, let's turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 32. 1 Samuel 17 and verse 32. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fall, uh, fail because of him, that is, of Goliath. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go up against the Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I, came, uh, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. Now, David had faith. David had courage. David had a conviction that Goliath wouldn't be any problem for him. 
In spite of Saul's warning and counsel, David, you're too young, you're too inexperienced, you're too, too little, you don't know how to do it, he's too big for you. David stood there and he said, I know, King Saul, that I can take care of that Philistine. I know that he's just as good as dead right now. Now, was David cocky? Was he a smart aleck? Did he really know something? Did he really have something going for him? How did he know that he could take care of the Goliath? Because he said, King, I slew a bear. I slew a lion. He said, These begin to attack my sheep. And he said, I went out there and confronted that lion, and I grabbed him by the beard, and I hit him over the head and killed him. He got experience. He knew his weapons. He knew what he could do with that sling. He had tested it. He had tried it. Where? Out there with the sheep. While he had ministered to the sheep. See, this is where we're learning the weapons of our warfare. We're not going out and, and confronting the wizards and the witches and the satan Satanists and all of that in the first level of warfare. God is gracious and He's training us in the sheepfold. And as we learn the lessons of our warfare in dealing with our ministry to the sheep, God is preparing us for a greater and an enlarged battle out yonder. And it's coming, brother. It's coming fast. There are already some head-on skirmishes with some of those giants out yonder. And we'd better get diligent about this thing. We'd better be serious about it. We'd better get involved in it and learn our lessons well today. Because when that thing gets thrust on you, it's not time to learn whether or not your weapon's going to be effective. The time to learn it is right now. The time to learn that your spiritual slingshot will do more than the, uh, than the swords, sword of the giant is right now. That's what we're going to learn. That very personal lesson. Now, personal deliverance is the first level of spiritual warfare. And I think that most of you are aware of this, that Jesus, in His earthly ministry, dealt a lot on the level of personal warfare ministry. He cast spirits, in other words, out of individuals. Let's go to the Gospel of Matthew, just for a few quick insights. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 24. 424. And His fame went throughout all Syria... And they brought unto him all sick people, and they that were taken with divers diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those which had palsy, and he healed them. He healed those who were possessed with devils. Chapter 8 and verse 16. When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word, and healed all that were sick. Jesus cast demons out of individuals. Chapter 8, verse 28. When he was come to the other side into the country of the Gergeshines, there met him two possessed with devils, coming out of the tombs, exceeding fear, so that no man might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee? Jesus delivered the Gadarene demoniacs, casting spirits out. In chapter 9, verse 32. As they went out, behold, they brought to him a dumb man possessed with a devil. And when the devil was cast out, the dumb spake, and the multitude marveled. On and on. Those are just a few little examples right there in the Gospel of Matthew in close proximity one to another to show us the level of warfare person to person. Jesus one-on-one -on -one, casting spirits out. Do you realize that every commission that Jesus ever gave included the commission to cast out devils? If you study, you'll find when Jesus sent out the twelve, He gave them authority over the unclean spirits. When Jesus took seventy of His followers, divided them into teams, and sent them out, they came back rejoicing and said, Jesus, even the demons were subject unto us in your name. And when Jesus gave the commission to the church, they that believe in me and my name shall they cast out devils. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And he had taught them, and he had given them commandment concerning authority over unclean spirits. Part of the great commission, as we used to call it, is to go out in the name of Jesus and to engage ourselves in spiritual warfare and cast down the forces of evil. All right, we're still talking about appreciating and understanding the ministry of deliverance. You know, what will help us more than anything else is to understand the spiritual armor and the spiritual weapons that we have and how to use them. You know, it's amazing how many things I wasn't taught when I grew up in the church. I grew up in a church that preached the Bible all the time. We studied it. Even in Sunday school, even though we found out now that's not scriptural. Hallelujah. We, we used to study the Bible then. But you know, there's a lot of things I didn't learn during all those years. 
It seems like we just sort of went over the same little one, two, three A B C. And we're learning a lot of things are in the Bible we used to not think were in there, not know about. But the weapons of our warfare. Now, there are quite a few of them. Let me just name some of the more obvious, more of the uh, more basic weapons of our warfare and how these are brought into play. First of all, let me call your attention again to Ephesians chapter six, verses ten through eighteen. This is where it speaks of the Christian armor. Saints Since we are in spiritual warfare, we must have on our spiritual armor. The devil does have ability to hurt. He does have the ability to destroy. The devil can come against us, but if we are to escape that vulnerability of the devil, we must put on the whole armor of God. But if you don't have on the whole armor of God, then you have reason to be concerned. And it talks about the armor. You know, the armor is a practical thing. Do you appreciate how practical God is? You know, sometimes I, I used to think God was way up here, you know, and, and everything He said was so theologically profound that nobody could understand it or comprehend it. I'm beginning to appreciate more and more each day just how practical, down to earth, right into our lives, God is and His Word is. See, when He says for us to put on the breastplate of righteousness... And to put on the helmet of salvation and take the shield of faith and be girt about with truth and all of these parts of the armor. See, this is not a little routine or a little ritual somebody goes through. I've known people that said, I, you know, I put on the armor every day. I get up and the first thing that I do, I put on, I girt myself. And they go through a little ritual. Girt myself with truth, put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, take the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit. As though that were going to give them any protection. I tell you, you're going to have to have much more going for you than that little ritual. When he talks about putting on the breastplate of righteousness, he means to live in righteousness and conduct before the Lord. To obey God and do what God tells you to do. That's what putting on righteousness is all about. When he tells you to take the shield of faith, you better have a shield of faith. Those are to quench the fiery darts of the devil. I tell you, they'll come at you from every direction and you better be ready. You better have a ready faith. If the dark comes from this direction, see that shield is on your arm and it's movable. And you can move it in a direction to stop that dart of the enemy just at a moment. When that dart begins to come towards you, you can turn that shield and intercept it. If the dart is coming from this direction, you can turn the shield back there and intercept it. But faith is important. We must have a living, vital faith and trust and dependence upon God. And we'd better know of our stand in the Lord. I tell you, I can't preach on all of this today, but I'm just saying enough to emphasize it to your little minds that we've got to get this into our spirit. We've got to have on the armor of God. We've got to have every part of it on in a spiritual and in a practical way if we're going to go into spiritual battle. That's part of it. Now, he mentioned some of the weapons of warfare in Scripture. Mark 16, 17, In my name shall they cast out devils. I tell you, they don't don't tremble at the name of Frank Hammond. But they sure do tremble at the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I've seen that so many times. That's so precious. I tell you, you know, before I got the baptism of the Holy Spirit and got into deliverance, I used to have some doubts. Did you ever have doubts? Sometimes I doubt, is this real? Is God even real? Is heaven even real? Is salvation even real? I used to have some doubts. But I tell you, you get into the things of the Spirit, and there's no room for doubt. Hallelujah. You see them as living reality. I've seen devils put their hands, cause a person to put the hands over their ears to try to shut out the sound of the name of Jesus. Say, quit saying that name. I can't stand it. Power in the name of Jesus. Power in the blood of Jesus. In Revelation 12, 11, it mentions a couple of pieces of armor there. The blood and the testimony. The blood of the Lamb. That's power. I've seen devils. I heard one one time that said something. Man, he was so tormented. And we were singing the chorus about the blood of Jesus. And he said, quit singing that song. I can't stand to hear that thing. He says, it just tears me up. He said, that blood is so red and it's so warm and it's so alive and it just covers everything. He was upset. Hallelujah. And that's the reason he was upset. That blood is alive. That blood is power. That blood is atoning blood. It's a covering blood. And we're in the protection of that blood. Devils hate mention of the blood of Jesus. You know, some people want to take it out of their songbooks. I was talking to a lady just this week. She says, one of the hardest problems I've had trying to come into the Christian life is to deal with the blood. She says, I read Maxwell Hoyt's little book the other day on the blood and said it helped me more than anything I ever read. But she said, I've always been kind of repulsed by the mention of blood. 
But I tell you, the devils in people make them repulsed at the blood of Jesus. The devils hate the power because that's power that a devil doesn't have, the power that's in the blood. And the word of testimony. See, we as Christians have a testimony. It's good to know who you are. Your testimony is who you are and what Jesus has done for you. All of us should have at least that basic testimony and a lot of fresh testimonies. But it's good to know who you are. I tell many times I get such a kick out of this. And I saw this preacher again uh, last May. I was up in Colorado where he lives. Any of you ever go to, through Rifle, Colorado? You have my permission to stop and knock on the door of a Pentecostal preacher up there, Dale Whittington. He's a precious brother. And he invited me over to his church to minister and teach on deliverance. And a week before, he didn't even believe that a Christian could have a devil. And so he invited me over. He heard about it, but he was one of those with a teachable spirit. When he heard truth, he embraced it. He heard a little bit of truth about Christians having devils, and he called me over there to minister in his church. And I went over there, and so he was watching me cast devils out. And uh, I kept saying, now, Dale, you have the same authority. You can deal with them, too. So you command them to come out. You need to learn how to do this. Well, about the second day, we'd been in ministry all day, Monday and then Tuesday, he was there. And I said, now, Dale, come on now. I want you to get on. I want you to... I said, this next one, now, you call this spirit out. We was ministering to a woman. And so he was sitting in a seat, and he got on the edge of his seat, you know, and, and he, he raised up a little bit, you know. He was working himself into it. And, and he pointed his finger towards the woman, and he said, all right, now, you demon, in the name of Jesus... And he got about that far, and the demon spoke through that woman and said, Who do you think you are? And that Pentecostal preacher, he just froze, just like this, you know, man. You, just, you could just see his mind was just whirling, and he was trying to think, What have I done? What have I gotten into? What do I do next? <laughs> and Ida May spoke up, and she said, Demon, he is God's child, and he has authority over you, and you must obey him in the name of Jesus. And that preacher said, Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> Hallelujah. I tell you, he got after that thing and he commanded it and it came out of that person. And that got him turned on as a deliverance minister. He found out demons would obey him in the name of Jesus. It's good to know who you are. It's good to know your testimony. That I'm a child of God and I have power over the devil. That's good to know. All right? Of course, another weapon is the Word of God. Ephesians 6.17. This is what Jesus used in the temptation experience in Matthew 4 when the devil came to him. He used the sword of the Spirit against the enemy. It's a powerful weapon. Praise is a powerful weapon. You remember when little David came and played? When uh, King Saul was overtaken by an evil spirit and he came and played and sang? And how that the Spirit left Saul? There's power in praise. Psalm 149 tells us that we have power to bind the enemy with fetters of chains. Praise binds the enemy. Now, let me call your attention to this important thing about each one of the weapons that we have mentioned. Did you notice that each one of these weapons are brought into force through speech, through the mouth? The blood of Jesus becomes a weapon when we speak of the power in that blood. When we begin to tell what the blood of Jesus does, that the blood of Jesus saves, that the blood of Jesus sanctifies, that the blood of Jesus justifies, that the blood of Jesus atones. When we give testimony through our mouth of the power and the work of the blood, then the blood becomes a weapon against the enemy. We may know the name of Jesus, but it becomes a weapon when we begin to speak the name of Jesus. The word of our testimony becomes a power against the enemy when we begin to speak that testimony. The Word of God becomes a weapon when we begin to speak the Word of God. The weapons of our warfare are put into force through the spoken Word. I was in a meeting one time and we had about 500 people crowded into an auditorium. We were having a group deliverance session. And a demon took over a fellow in the back of the room and he was flailing and screaming and falling around and stumbling. And some people rushed back there and by the time one of the counselors got back there, he was just about covered up. You could hardly find him for the Bibles. People were throwing Bibles on top of that guy. That's using the sword of the Spirit on him. But do you know not one devil came out of that man? Not one devil was impressed by those Bibles being thrown on top of him. But when somebody came back there and began to use the Word of God in an authoritative way, then those devils took heed and then those devils left. We've got to learn how to use the Word of God. Not like a fetish. Throw it on them like some charm. Hallelujah. 
Well, praise God. All right, the weapons of our warfare. It's important to know. It's important to know that you have power and authority in the name of Jesus. See, you have both power and authority. As a Christian, you have an authority. You have the use of the name of Jesus and the authority that it bears. And you have the power which comes by the anointing of God's Holy Spirit. As the Spirit comes, the gifts of the Spirit come into operation. You receive discerning of spirits. You receive words of knowledge. You receive faith and so forth, which are the operations of the power of God's Holy Spirit. I was talking to a fellow one time. I met him on an airplane flight. He, he's an important man in the Baptist circles, has a big uh, title and a big responsibility. And it was so interesting. God just put us together in seats adjacent to one another on that airline. you believe God does things like that? He did that. In fact, that fellow had a seat and they'd put him back next to the smoking section and he was irritated by that. And he saw a vacant seat up there by us so he scratched out his boarding pass, put a different number on it, and moved up there where we were. And uh, when we got there, uh, he bowed and, and said a prayer when they gave him some food, and we did. And so we said, well, you must be a Christian. He said, well, I certainly am. And so we told him that, found out he was a Baptist missionary, and we had been with the Baptists. And we'd just kind of gotten acquainted there a little bit, and he looked at me and he said, do you know anything about the demons? Well, what a leading question. I couldn't believe my ears. I said, what did you say? But anyway, I got to talking to him, and he'd been involved in deliverance ministry, but did not have the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, that's trying to fight with one hand tied behind you. See, he had no discerning of spirit. We said, do you have discerning of spirit? He didn't even know what that was. The only way he knew to find out what demon was there was to try to force the demon, one of them, to talk and to tell on the rest of them. That's the only way he knew. And they'd work for hours trying to get people, but they had no discerning of spirits. And so we were able to explain to him a more excellent way. So you need both the authority of the name of Jesus. Somebody without the baptism in the Holy Spirit has an authority, but you need the power. You need everything that God has made available to you when you come against the power of the enemy. All right, let's hasten on, because we want to save some time for ministry. But I want to mention, to appreciate and understand the ministry of deliverance, we need to have a comprehension of the wiles of the devil. The wiles have to do with the methods that the devil follows. The devil has certain goals and the devil has certain methods. You know that the devil has as his goal the goal of ruling over the world? He wants his kingdom to come on earth. You know, he's a counterfeiter. He's a duplicator. He's a copycat. He just looks at what God is doing and he says, well, that's what I'm going to do. Jesus says, my kingdom will come on earth even as it is in heaven. The devil says, no, my kingdom is going to come on earth. Jesus says, I'm going to put my kingdom into the heart of every believer. The devil says, I'm going to put my kingdom into every, every person I can. See, he's a copycat. The devil says, I'm going to rule the world by ruling individuals. Just like God says, the kingdom is going to come on earth, and it's going to come through the kingdom being established in the hearts and lives of individuals. The devil is a counterfeiter. And he has methods, and he has lies, and he has wiles to bring about his purposes. I believe. My conviction and conclusion is that the devil basically works through deception. Deception is a main avenue of work for the devil. You know, I got to reading one day the scriptures that have to do with the end time. I wanted to say, well, what, what all do the scriptures say concerning the last days? And as I began to search out those scriptures and read them, something began to come out over and over again. Be not deceived. Deceive not your own self. Let no man deceive you. There shall be doctrines of devils, and so on. I began to see that one of the greatest thrusts against the church in the last days is the deception of the devil. We'd better be aware of it. I tell you, there are many people caught today in traps of deception. Many being caught in snares and traps of deception. Do you know who the last person is to know when they're deceived? Because deception basically defined as thinking you are right when you are wrong. And so the person who's deceived, everybody around them knows they're in the deception except them. Because I'm right. I'm not deceived. The devil tried to pull the wool over your eyes. Now he uses avenues to bring deception. Let me mention the three basic avenues of deception. One is counterfeitism. The devil is an artist at counterfeiting. The other day I went into our local bank and they had a, a display there that had come down through the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve had, had uh, provided for this display. And they had $100 bills, $50 bills, 20s, 5s, and 1s. 
And they had a counterfeit of each one of those denominations, and beside it they had a real one. And they had a little push-button thing there that you try to pick out and decide which is the counterfeit and which is the real. And you push a button. If a red light came on, you were wrong. If a blue light came on, you were right. And so it was a matter... And you know, it, it was clever. Looking at those things, I said it was a little bit easier to tell which was the counterfeit, having two there side by side to compare a real one with a counterfeit. But if you just met that counterfeit one out yonder without a real one to lay up beside it, it would have been a lot more difficult. But the thing that got my attention was how close to the real the counterfeit fit appeared to be. But it's completely counterfeit. It's completely counterfeit, but it looks a whole lot like the real thing. Now, that's the way that the devil's counterfeitism works. You see, the whole realm of the occult is counterfeit. There is no truth. There is nothing of God whatsoever in it. It is absolutely, completely false. Spiritualism, uh, the occult, uh, witchcraft, Satanism, all of these things, completely false. But, you know, a lot of people are turning in those things and to those things because they are fascinated by the supernatural element in those things. And their curiosity gets them involved in these things, and they're drawn into those deceptions of the enemy. That's an outright counterfeit. Now, another thing that the devil uses is mixture. Is mixture. He takes something that, to begin with, is real, it's true, it's of God, and then he puts in his content mixture of error, of lies, and it becomes ruined. See, this is the whole realm of the cults. You have you have groups like the seventh uh, the uh, the Mormons, the Christian Scientists, Unity, and so on. See these groups. Even you take things like Masonry, Alcoholics Anonymous. That's another one that shocks a lot of people. You see these things use references to God. They will use some references of Scripture, but they leave out the blood atonement of Jesus Christ and giving glory to God. They bring in mixture into that which is true, and as a result, the whole is ruined, the whole is poisoned, the whole is contaminated. I say it like this, if, if somebody offers you a glass of water, and just before you took it, they dumped in a little strychnine, they say, well, it's pure water, just got a little stuff in it. You say, no, thank you. Well, strain it between your teeth. Strain out the poison between your teeth while you're drinking it. You know, some people try to do that with the cults. They say, well, we'll let, these, we'll let these Mormon missionaries come in and give their little spiel to us because everybody's got some good. And we, we'll listen and, and we will pick out the things that are good and the things that are true and we'll throw the rest of it out. That's trying to drink a glass of water that's got poison in it and strain it through your teeth. You get just about as satisfactory results They're trying to pick out what is good and leave the other. The devil works through mixture. Throw it all out. Don't try to salvage any of it. When it's mixed, throw the whole thing out. Another way that the devil works is through substitution. He gets us to substitute his way for God's way. Now, here's where many of us really fall into deception. And as I'll be teaching you in the next couple of days, this will come out much more clear and much more fully defined of how we become victims through the wiles of the devil in deceiving us, in receiving something that he offers rather than something that God offers. Here's a very simple illustration of it, but yet a very needed illustration. Suppose that somebody offends you. You know, people are always saying things that they shouldn't say. People are always hurting other people. And most of us find people saying things that are unkind. I had one of my relatives write me the other day and said, Frank said, uh, said I can't understand why you're doing what you're doing, living the kind of life that, that as far as I'm concerned, it's one of the most useless, self-defeating lives that anybody could live, what you're doing. Thank you, Jesus. See, people say things to hurt you. People say things to offend you, to wound you. But what does God say to do if somebody offends you? Pray for them, love them, forgive them. Don't let any resentment, bitterness, hatred, self-pity, any of that get in. All right, so you know what God tells you to do if somebody offends you. You forgive them, you love them, you pray for them, and you rejoice and praise God. Well, that's easy enough to remember, isn't it? Until you get hurt. And you get hurt, you get offended, you get wounded. And the devil comes and says, Boy, that was bad. That was really bad. Besides that, they did it once before. They don't deserve to be forgiven. They, they really deserve to be resented. You have a right to feel bitter towards them. Now, what he's doing, he's deceiving you. 
He's getting you to substitute His way as opposed to God's way. When we are hurt and we enter into bitterness, resentment, unforgiveness, retaliation, unkindness towards that person, we are doing the devil's thing as a substitute for God's thing. And that's where the devil leads many of us into deception. So we need to understand the ways and the workings of the devil. Well, I tell you, when God gets all of this going in our lives and we really begin to get set free, you know what's going to start resulting? We're going to be different. We're going to be changed. Have, have some of you already found out God's got you on a program of changing you? You know, it's just not a matter of playing church, you know, and going into a service and, and hallelujah in a little while. And, you know, there, there's some people that can't stand change. They don't want to change. Unfortunately, they don't want to change. I don't know about some of the rest of you ministers, but I've met quite a few of these. They really don't, basically don't want to change. And so when God puts, begins to put pressure on them in a certain church to affect change in their life, all of a sudden they feel led of the Lord to go somewhere else. And they go over somewhere, and then God begins to hem them up over there and said, all right, we're going to have to change this. And then they get another leading, well, I've got to go somewhere else. And they're a bunch of grasshopper Christians. They just hop in here, there, and yonder. They won't stay and let God get these things worked out in their lives. But I tell you, folks, that's what God's doing today. He's changing us. Deliverance is part of the process that God is utilizing to bring us into change. Amen? So we need to understand it. We need to cooperate with it. We need to flow with what God is doing and let God work the change in us. Not change just for the sake of change, but change to bring us into conformity to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, if you're already exactly like Jesus, you, you, you can go. I mean, you know, <laughs> there's nothing more for you in this God if you're already totally like Jesus. But if you're not like Jesus, then there are areas that need to be changed because the Scripture says He doesn't change. If we're going to be like Jesus and He doesn't change, guess who automatically has to do the changing? That's just simple arithmetic, isn't it? You know, God began to work some changes in my life. Some of it's just been completely hilarious. Looking back on it at the time, man, it ripped my flesh. I tell you, this changing process, it will turn you wrong side out sometimes. And there'll be an error of your life, you know, and you just, you know, you've kind of pushed it back, you know, and hit it under the carpet years ago and, and wanted to forget it. And God have a way of saying, all right, now we're going to deal with that thing that you never did really deal with. You just kind of suppressed it and pushed it out of sight. God, you wouldn't. God, God you wouldn't bring that up. I mean, you wouldn't. Lord, no. Let, I mean, nobody knows about that but me and you. Now, Lord, let's just leave that alone. God says, no, because it's a hindrance to you. It's something that's got to be dealt with. And God has a way of bringing those things out. We get habit patterns. You know how we just creatures of habit? And we build up habits, and a lot of them are not pleasing to the Lord. A lot of them are not glorifying to the Lord. A lot of them are, are contrary to, to the way that God wants us to have the order in our lives. And, and God says, you're going to change that. i tell you, one of them that ripped my flesh the most. Through the years, I had built up a pattern of doing a lot of things that Ida May should be doing. I took on a lot of her responsibilities. My mother trained me as a young boy to help her in the kitchen and to help her with housework and things like that. So consequently, when Ida Mae and I got married, I knew more about how to run a house than she did. I knew more about buying groceries. I knew more about cooking. I knew more about washing and ironing. I knew everything better than she did. And so whatever she tried to do, I was standing over her shoulder, breathing down her collar, and telling her how to do it. When, we went, when she went to season the soup, I'd say, now, how much Worcestershire sauce did you put in there? How much this, that, and the other? Did you remember to do so-and-so? And you know how the man hated the kitchen. I couldn't understand why she hated the kitchen. God began to deal with me, and God told me one day, He says, you're going to quit doing the housework, and you're going to turn it over to her. You're going to quit fooling with the kitchen, you're going to let her do the cooking. I said, God, she doesn't know anything about it. And God kept insisting. Now, this looks ridiculous, doesn't it? But I want you to know the thing that tore my flesh the worst was when I couldn't go to the grocery store and supervise the grocery buying. I tell you, I didn't act too graceful. I wasn't too sweet about it. I fought and I kicked and I was ugly. But you know, I've got all that behind me now. And I'm out of all of that. And Ida May is in charge. The kingdom, her little kingdom is in the kitchen. And I tell you, she enjoys that kitchen. I never saw such a transformation in my life as the transformation in her. It's amazing how she loves that kitchen. It's amazing how she loves to cook. 
She's always working on new recipes and learning to do this and that that she hadn't done before. It's plumb enjoyable to her because God worked out some things between us. And God says, you're going to change this way. Well, I didn't want to change it, but after it got changed, I surely am glad. I tell you, the peace, the fruit, the joy, the blessing that comes by the change. Now, this is what you're going to find out. God's going to be dealing in this conference with your lives and some areas in your life. And He says, I want you to change that attitude. I want you to change that habit. I want you to change your disposition. You got a reputation for being ornery and mean? God says, I want you to change that. If you've been a worrier, you've been filled with anxiety, if you've been depressed, God says, I want you to change that. I don't want depressed kids. I want happy kids. You say, Lord, I've been this way 40 years. God says, you're still going to change it. If you will agree with change and get excited about change and experience change, then you will know the blessing of change. Hallelujah. I tell you, it'll, I, I have to be honest with you, it'll rip your flesh upside, one side and down the other while you're going through the process. But when it's over with, you'll be so glad that you obeyed the Lord. Can you say amen to that? Are you ready to change? Hallelujah. Well, pray for I just found out we're going to have some deliverance. It's <laughs> a good thing to know, isn't it? Why don't we stand? Brother David, are you our official... Praise man. Would you bless us? Do you need this little mic? Praise the Lord. Amen. Are of my word and by my spirit. For I have spoken that I would raise up out of a valley of dry bones an exceeding great army. And that army is to stand mighty upon their feet. Yea, for even the ancient prophet did see and did say, Who is she that looketh forth as the morning, clear as the sun, fair as the moon, and terrible as an army with banners? Yea, this is the army that I am raising up. For even I have said that I will do nothing except I first show it to my prophets. And yea, my prophets of old did write that there would be this exceeding great army that would be as mighty as a terrible army. Yea, that there would be a people, a company, yea, a host of my chosen ones whom I would make great even though before they were but dry bones. Yea, I would say unto you, that I am speaking to my prophets in this day, that all things which the prophets of old did write, the prophets of today are saying, must surely come to pass. And I would say that this is the generation that shall engage in conflict and shall be victorious over the evil one. Yea, rejoice and be glad, for even this is boot camp, saith the Lord. And this is training session. And you have not come just to be ministered unto, but to learn how you might minister to others. And I would say that you will do well to take heed and to follow the pattern of those who have begun teaching you. For I would say that even each of you, if you will yield to me and follow me, shall be as Hammond, shall be as Worley, shall be as others that go forth ministering. Yea, for they were ones that went in ahead as forerunners to prepare an army of deliverers. Yea, for my word does say that upon Mount Zion shall come deliverers, and they shall judge the Mount of Esau. And I say that you, my people, who receive deliverance, shall be deliverers in months and years to come, said the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Praise God. The Lord showed us that this place is being raised up as a place to teach deliverance, a school of deliverance. And that's the purpose of this place, and that's our determination, is that this place shall be a place where deliverance shall be taught as the main theme. And we have been told by many ministers who have come here and who have seen us in the past that the Lord is preparing a place for the teaching of, men of deliverance. And we are determined that this place shall be completed to that end where the ministers will come in and there will be classes that will be held that, that will be held as a regular school teaching the theme of deliverance. Pull, uh, pull the organ down as a piano. Pull the piano. Far right. And we're going to move right in now to deliverance. Brother Hammond, come on and teach us some more. Praise the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. We want you to be relaxed. I don't know how to be real formal and dignified. That's part of what I got delivered from. <laughs> Seminary, they told us to always... Stand, you know, not use any abnormal gestures or anything when we ministered. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. It's good to just be yourself. You know, that's 
The Lord just wants us to be who we are, whom He's made us to be, and we're His creation. You don't have to be somebody else. Isn't that good? I don't have to be David or Wynn or Glenn or anybody else. I just be Frank. <laughs> Hallelujah. So you be relaxed. You be at ease. You've been bombarded up here by a variety of ministers. But you just be relaxed. We all love you and we all love one another and we're just here to see that we really get set free in the Lord. We have power and authority. Let me ask, are, are any of you here sort of new in, in the teaching and emphasis on deliverance? Is this kind of new to a few of you? All right, there are a few of you that are more or less a novice and on the ground floor. Well, we try not to throw you in the cold water all at one time. Uh, not try to overwhelm you with what takes place. You just enter in as much as you're able to as, as the Lord leads us in deliverance. The Lord has given me a few things to emphasize this afternoon. Now, within the ministry of deliverance, there'll be a little bit of variation sometimes in, in techniques and, and methods, but not a whole lot of that. I feel like those of us who are ministering here are pretty much in the flow of one another's ministries. So you just enter in. I found that there are a few things that are helpful, very helpful, very practical uh, conditions that need to be met before we get into a ministry of deliverance and, and the probability that uh, you have either yesterday or in some other previous occasion had a chance to clear up these things. One thing that keeps prevailing as a hindrance or blockage to deliverance is unforgiveness. I've seen this over and over again. I've seen people that are thrown in the floor by the power of spirits and the demons talking through them and and no matter how much we exhort those demons to come out, they wouldn't come out until a condition was met. And this is a scriptural condition in Matthew 18. That unless we forgive, we are turned over to the tormentors until we forgive. Now, this is an act of our will. It's not a matter of feeling or emotion. It's a matter of will. If you've had a problem with someone else who's hurt you or offended you in some way, release that through your forgiveness on the basis that Jesus has completely forgiven you. See, when you ask Him to forgive you, you want Him to do that. And so Jesus says, forgive others even as He's forgiven us. So as He forgives us, we must be willing to forgive others. If we don't, the Master will turn us over to the tormentors. He'll permit the evil spirits to harass us until they... Well, let's, let's uh, hold some of those questions. I feel like, a, sister, a lot of these questions will be answered as we progress in the teaching. And uh, right now, we want to move and spend this time. I believe the Lord wants us to move right in to deliverance without any hindrance there. So, if you'll just hold that or we can talk to you privately, we'll answer. Because everyone, if we opened up for questions, everybody's got questions. Hallelujah. All right. Let me, uh, I was emphasizing a few of the things that cause hindrances to deliverance. Uh, involvement in cults and occults, anything of the satanic kingdom, Eastern religions, meditation, we found that people who have gotten into TM, Transcendental Meditation, and things like that uh, really need to get these things cleared up as a priority to lead them on in to, to further aspects of deliverance. So if any of you have, have been in these areas and haven't been set free in those areas, then let's count these things as a priority. But then, do we have those that are going to serve as counselors working around the room? If, if, do you do that here? Or? All right, they know who they are. All right. So several have been designated and you work in deliverance and you'll be moving around the room and helping during the process of deliverance. Now let me lead you in a, in a deliverance prayer. We're going to believe the Lord to, to set us free and then I'll share with you those areas that the Lord is impressing me to deal with and then we'll just go as the, as the Lord shows us. All right, say this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus I, am your child. I am your child. You love me and have redeemed me. Lord, I come to you confessing my sins. I'm sorry for them all. I ask you to forgive me. And as you forgive me, I forgive all others who trespassed against me. Lord, I especially ask forgiveness for sins in the realm of the occult and cults and anything which is directly of Satan's kingdom. I purpose in my heart that I will turn to no other source 
other than you, Lord, for wisdom, for guidance, for knowledge, or for power. You are my source. Lord, I desire to live for you, for my life to glorify you. And you've said in your word that whoever calls upon your name shall be delivered. I call upon you today in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Deliver me and set me free. Now let's say these words to Satan. Satan, I renounce you and all your works. I loose myself from you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I take back all the ground that was ever yielded to you. I belong to the Lord. He is the Lord of my life. You have no place in me, no part in me, and I command you to go in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. This is the end of Part A. Please play Part B. Thank you. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. Dot com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Wednesday afternoon, December the 27th, 1978. Lake Hamilton Bible Camp Midwinter Camp Meeting being held in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Frank Hammond is a speaker of the afternoon. This is now the conclusion of this message from Part A. Now, an area that I want us to minister in today is in reference to things that come by means of inheritance. I find this more and more prevalent. And the more deliverance ministers I talk with, the more I find out that God has led them in this same direction. Spirits try to perpetuate themselves within family situations and settings. And we find that many people have problems that were passed down. See, I had some of these myself. I had physical problems. I had emotional problems. And I accepted them for years because I said, well, I inherited this from my mother. I inherited this from my father. I'm just like them. I have this certain weakness. I found that the psalmist said that God hath chosen our inheritance for us. The devil doesn't choose our inheritance. And a lot of things that we have accepted as inheritance are not truly inheritance. Weaknesses and, uh, and failures, uh, traits of anger, temper, disposition, things like that. We say, well, I'm like my daddy. I've got his anger. Well, we don't confess that anymore. So we want to take away from the enemy anything that has come into our lives through inheritance. Now let the Lord begin to reveal to you anything that has come down under the guise of an inheritance. And we're going to break all curses that would come down through inheritance. The Scripture says that sometimes there are problems that come down as judgments They came down upon people from one generation to another. Jesus has borne the curse of the law for us. And in the Old Testament, where they didn't have that provision, that curse could be perpetuated. But today it cannot be perpetuated in the life of a believer who will exercise his authority and his position in the Lord. In other words, you don't have to continue under some kind of a problem because your father or mother or your grandparents or great-grandparents had that problem. You can use your position of authority and say, in Jesus' name, that curse is broken and every spirit that's been operating under the guise of that curse, his power is broken and gone now in the name of Jesus. And many of you need to be set free from those kinds of curses and inheritance influences that the devil has sought to perpetrate in your life. So many of you I anticipate right now are going to get a real needed and a valid ministry of deliverance in these areas. So you enter into it by faith. Remember that spirits are associated with breath. The word for spirit in the New Testament is the same as the word for breath. 
And you enter into it with your will. One of the most difficult persons to get set free is a passive person. Now, these devils have harassed you long enough. And you get mad at them? Jesus said, we, God said, we can hate those that hate him. We can hate the devil. That's, that's one legitimate hate we can have. Because of what he has done for us. We say, devil, we are through with you in the name of Jesus. Now, you're going to get out of me. And you can help to push him out. When we command him, you can accelerate the process of deliverance by breathing those things out. Now, don't be an extremist on the breathing. Now, some people are just so determined they're going to get that devil out. They go, <laughs> you know, and first thing you know, they hyperventilate and fall out. Well, don't get scared to that excess, but don't go to the other extreme either. Don't be so self-conscious and anemic that you just sit there afraid somebody's going to see you, you know. Uh, don't be afraid to get in there with it. Be sure that those spirits are out. Stand against them in the authority of Jesus' name. Let your will be exercised as you purpose to breathe those things out. And many times that's just like priming the pump. And other things will happen when you really get involved in it with your spirit and with your will. All right? Let's renounce all inherited influences and curses. And then when I command them to go in the name of Jesus... You start breathing them out and let them go out. Paper towels have been dispensed here. This is a coming out of party. I thought I'd show you. Yeah, here David's got some. All right. Some of the men have towels there. Take one in faith. That's an act of faith. If you don't need it, maybe your neighbor will. Some people have dry deliverances and some of them have wet deliverances. Praise the Lord. The main thing is that they come out. At a party, they always pass you a napkin. So well, this is a coming out party, so you, you get a napkin. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Everybody re relaxed? Everybody confident in the Lord? Nobody scared? You shall tread upon serpents and scorpions, and they shall in no wise hurt you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. All right. All right, say this with me. In the name of Jesus, I break every family curse, every demonic inheritance. I command all such spirits in the name of Jesus, go. All right, come on out of them right now. In the name of Jesus, all over this room, I command. That's right, you spirits, come on out. You family inheritance spirits, you family, you devils that's passed down through the mother's ancestry line, in the name of Jesus, you spirits of mother weakness, I command you to go right now. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, every curse, every curse that came in through mothers and fathers, I command you right now, in the mighty name of Jesus. Now, come on out of God's people. We're God's people, and Jesus has borne the power and broken the curse off of us in the name of Jesus. Now, you must go. Now, keep coming out. Keep coming out right now in the name of Jesus. 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 Name of Jesus. Every demon of curse, I command you right now in the power of Jesus' name. Go in Jesus' name. Go in Jesus' name. Come on out right now in the authority of Jesus. By the power of the blood of Jesus. By the power of the blood of Jesus. That's right. Now, come on out of them. Come on out, you family inheritance spirit. You family inheritance spirit. Go now in the name of Jesus. Go now in the name of Jesus. All the weaknesses, all the infirmities, all you family weakness and infirmity spirits, I command you to go in the name of Jesus. All spirits that are passed down under the guise of an inheritance, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, you heart infirmity, I command you to go in the name of Jesus. That is not our inheritance, and we break that curse in the power of Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. All right, keep letting them come out. Now, uh, some of you may have a little problem trying to decide, well, I don't know whether I've got any of that or not. Uh, you know, this is one way to give the devil an excuse to get away. Let's challenge everything. You know, it's better to challenge something that may not be there than to leave unchallenged something that is. And I always make a guarantee in these services. That if a demon's not in you, it won't come out just because we call it. Okay? But if it is there in the name of Jesus and you enter in, it's going to come out. So a lot depends on your will and your entering in. And we want you to get the full benefit of what God has for you. Now, we're going to break these curses back several generations, back ten generations. We're going to break them back off of you right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. We have power in the precious name of Jesus. Every one of you curses that goes back ten generations in our families. We do not accept any demonic inheritance or bondage from our generations past and our ancestry. In the name of Jesus, 
we break asunder all of that inheritance and we command every spirit coming down through that ancestral line in the name of Jesus. Now go. Go now. Quickly. Quickly. Release them. Now if you've got something particular, let one of these workers come in and lay hands on you and command it directly. Just motion for one of them. They'll come in and minister to you directly. If you know something specific you feel like needs to be dealt with. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. You have something? Uh, praise the Lord. All right. Let's say after a little more. There's a few more that need to come out. In the name of Jesus, you inherited spirits. Come on out. You spirits of family inheritance, we break that curse right now in the authority of the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, you spirits of bodily infirmities and bodily weaknesses, I command you to go. In the name of Jesus, weak eyes, I command you to go. Eye infirmity spirits, I command you to go in the name of Jesus. I command you to go in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I command you to go right now in the power of the blood of Jesus. In the power of the blood of Jesus. All of those infirmities, I command to come out right now in the name of Jesus. Every curse that came down through our families because of our ancestors' involvement in the satanic kingdom, we break those curses and we rid ourselves of them in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. That's good. Many are coming out. Many are coming out. Let them continue to go. Right now, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. That's right. By the power of the blood of Jesus. By the power of the blood of Jesus. That's right. Come on out right now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. That demonic bondage must go. That family bondage must go. In the name of Jesus. 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 In the name of Jesus, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The Lord is showing me that some of you are under a, a family control spirit. A family control spirit. In other words, that, that uh, parents or someone in the family has sought to control your life and you've been afraid. You've been afraid. Well, I'm going to hurt them. I know that that is unnatural. I know that that is not of God. And I don't want to hurt them. And you've been hesitant to break that control influence. I'll give you an illustration in my own life. My mother was a precious Christian lady, woman and a mother to me, and loved me very much. But there were some things that she didn't know about that she was imposing on me. And she had a lot of things that were meaningful to her. Little objects, pictures, and so forth. And she programmed me before she died that I was custodian of all of those things. I was responsible for those things. And they didn't mean a hill of beans to me. But see, out of a sense of what I suppose was loyalty to my mother, I had to really take care of all of these little things that she wrote notes on and told me about and to preserve them. And I tell you, when I found out God didn't require me to do that and I got rid of that garbage, I tell you, it was really a relief to me. And God's saying that there's some of you here that are just like that. You're trying to perpetuate... Things within a family that God's not in, they're just material, fleshly, soulish things, and they don't minister anything, but they just keep you all tied up in knots, keep you filled with fears and anxieties and worries, because you're under control spirit, you're under possessive spirit, and God wants you to be set free from those things. If you'll agree with it, you can be set free from it. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, we stand together against you spirits of family control. You spirits of family control and bondage in the name of Jesus... I command you now to go. Come on out of God's people right now. All over this room. All over this room. In the name of Jesus. Come on out. You old family fears. You old family fears. You old family manipulation spirits. In the name of Jesus. Family pressure spirits in the name of Jesus. Family conformity spirits in the name of Jesus. I command you to go. Family tradition. That's his name. Family tradition. I command you to go in the name of Jesus. Spirits of family tradition, I command you, go now. Go now in the name of Jesus. Family tradition, devils, come on out of God's people. All over this room. Family tradition, we break that bondage tradition. In the name of Jesus. In the power of the blood of Jesus. In the power of the blood of Jesus. Family tradition, in the name of Jesus. 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 Come on out. Family tradition, spirit. I command you to go in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Some of you really needed this. You really needed this. Others still coming out. Let them go. That's right. All over this room. Let them go. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. 
praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Remember, Jesus said, you know the truth, and the truth will make you free. You know, many of us have been in all kinds of bondage to traditions of man. Religious traditions and human traditions have a lot of people in bondage. See, we're right in the midst of a season of the year when a lot of people have been in a traditional bondage, which is not scriptural. A Christmas bondage. We've been in a lot of activities, you see, that are not... You know, Jesus said to the scribes and Pharisees one day, He says, you make the law of God of none effect by your tradition. And that's what tradition has a way of doing. The tradition of man becomes more important than the commandments of God. And the commandments of God are set aside for the sake of preserving a tradition. Hallelujah. A few years ago, I got interested in breaking traditions. I guess I'm what they call an iconoclast. I break up traditions and images. Hallelujah. And the freedom that you come into. Break those traditions. Man will hold you in fear while they'll say you're crazy. They sure will. I agree with that. They'll say you're crazy. Man, he is nuts. He has flipped. He don't believe in Santa Claus anymore. You know, here's an example. The Scripture says not to bear false witness. The Scripture says not to lie. That's the commandment of God. You tell a child there's a Santa Claus, you're lying. You're deceiving. You are making not the commandment of God in order to support a tradition. Amen. Did you ever cast out a Santa Claus spirit? Yeah. Santa Claus, Easter Bunny. I was ministering to a young lady one day, and, and the Spirit named itself Easter Bunny. And I said, you devil, hop out of there. And that's when I started hopping like a rabbit. Hallelujah. She had Peter Pan and all the rest of them. Praise the Lord. She had Santa Claus. Amen. We just better break those old traditions, religious traditions. Are you really ready to get free? I don't know. I haven't talked enough of you. I don't know how really ready you are. Amen. Praise God. Let's, let's break those old religious tradition spirits. You know, most of us have enough association with denominations and all, and denominations usually are built upon some truth that is just, you know, blown out of proportion to where it gets perverted. And we can get caught up in those things. I remember one religious devil told me one day, says, uh, that I'm, I'm a spirit of formalism. I'm a spirit of ritual. And I said, you devil, in the name of Jesus, what's the matter with being formal and ritual? That devil says, I keep the Holy Spirit from moving. See, when the Holy Spirit needs to be free to move, if you've got your bulletin printed, <laughs> and say, at 9.45 we're going to do this, and at 9.47 we're going to do that, see, that doesn't leave much room for the freedom of the Spirit, does it? That keeps the Holy Spirit from moving. God is a God of order. He doesn't lend himself to confusion. And the Holy Spirit, when He's leading, it's not going to be confusion, but it's going to be the Spirit leading rather than the flesh. One young lady I was ministering to said, uh, the demon through her said, I don't dance. I'm a Baptist. <laughs> and I said, and then he said, I don't like those tambourines either. And I said, you're one of those devils that hate praise. And I said, we're going to torment you with praise. So we got tambourines, we started singing and dancing, and that devil just went into a wild frenzy. But it came out as we praised the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So see, a lot of our tradition and religious formalism just hold us in bondage to keep us free from worshiping, from praising, from obeying the Lord. Let's challenge those things. Let's command them to leave us so we can be free to follow and flow in the Spirit of God. All right, in the name of Jesus... We stand against you spirits, you religious spirits, you spirits of religiosity, you old spirits of dead formalism and ritualism, you old spirits of traditional, uh, religious traditionalism in the name of Jesus. We know your kind. We know your evil working. We know how you try to hinder God. And we stand against you in the name of Jesus. Now, you spirits, I command you right now, in the name of Jesus, go. All right, release them in the name of Jesus. Come on out. Come on out, you old spirits of religious bondage. Religious bondage. You hate the name of Jesus. You hate the blood of Jesus. But you're coming out of us. You're defeated out of us right now in the name of Jesus. Right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on out. Spirits of religious bondage. Religious bondage. 
and dead formalism, I command you to go right now in the power of Jesus' name. Right now in the power of Jesus' name. By the power and authority of the blood of Jesus. Now go in His mighty name. In His mighty name. The rest of you religious devils, you religious bondage spirits, in the name of Jesus, you spirits of denominational pride, I command you to go. You spirits of religious pride, I command you to go in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. You religious fear spirits, I command you to go in the name of Jesus. Now come out of us. Go now, quickly. Go now. Leave us in the power of the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Now, there's another area the Lord has impressed me to deal with. I guess the two-bit label for it is imprecations. You know, an imprecation is a spoken curse. I hope I'm not getting on your territory too much, some of these things. I'm just following the Lord, though. Hallelujah. I, I heard that you were going to minister on curses or something to teach on that while you was here. Okay. Hallelujah. All right. God wants us to deal with this. Now, let me give you an example. Over in the book of Numbers, it gives us a principle and a pattern there. It talks about a family, and the daughter, the unmarried daughter in the family, makes a vow. She utters a vow. Now, it says that the father has the responsibility either to accept that vow or to disannul or disallow that vow. He can break the force of that vow. He is the spiritual authority in that family. The same thing is said in the same context of the wife in the family. That if his wife makes a statement or a vow that the husband feels like is not wise, the husband should break that vow. Now, if he doesn't, if he does not do it either by neglect or forthrightly uh, uh, permitting it, then that vow stands. But if he disallows it on the day that it is made, he breaks the force of that vow. Now, I found that this has a real application in our lives spiritually. That the husband and father in a family or the pastor or elder in the church who is in spiritual authority, when something is spoken over someone over whom he has authority, he must either accept that or he must disallow it. And if he does not break something that is wrong, then the force of that will carry on. Now, this happens in a lot of persons' lives. Somebody may have gotten mad at you sometimes, and they, and they spoke something evil against you. Like a, a lady that was under curses one time, and I could see as she was talking to me, God gave me discernment that she was under a curse. And I said, somebody put a curse on you. Who did that? She said, well, I don't know. Then she said, oh, wait a minute. She said, I used to have a lady that worked for me, and said she got mad at me one day, and she pointed her finger at me and said, you're not going to have anything but trouble for ten years. See, she spoke that as a curse over that woman's life. She had had two husbands that died violent deaths. She had four teenage children that were under curses and had real strange physical ailments in their body. And all the way through, as she began to tell me, I began to see a pattern of a natural accent of problems within that person's life. And the rootage of was back when that curse was spoken and that curse was not dealt with. So if there have been things that have been spoken over you, then we need to break the power of those curses. Now, now sometimes medical authorities will do that in ministering to a person. They will, they will prophesy something evil. They'll say, all right, you, you're going to die with this within six months. Are, are you going to, you're going to have this problem the rest of your life. See, that leaves no place for the healing power of Jesus and for the, for the grace and the miracle working part of the Lord. So if anybody has spoken anything negative or evil over you in any way at any time, we're going to break the power of those imprecations, those spoken curses in the name of Jesus and take that ground back so that none of that will have any effect in your life. You have a right quick statement or question? Well, this is the sort of general thing I'm talking about, yes. When something is, and, and, and see, it will be a blockage to one's faith. The doctor may be acting in the wisdom that he has as a, as a trained technician in, in that field, but it is not an expression of faith, and we are not to accept it. So we want to break the force of those things right now in the name of Jesus. Can it be done indirectly by, by intercession? I don't know if you had any experience in that area. 
No, I always take take a step in that direction. That's that's my policy, and we'll believe God. We'll believe God. I found this more effective when it's within a family of blood relationships, and and when it's done on the part of one who is moving in the Spirit of God and is really following in obedience and say, God led me to do this. Because God has timings for things. God has timings for things. All right, we're going to have to move on. Move on. I think you've got the general drift of it. All right, say with me. In the name of Jesus, I break every spoken curse off of my life. I accept no problems, no negative prophecies, In the name of Jesus, Jesus. all such spirits spirits. that have come in in. by spoken curses, curses. I command you right now, now. in the name of Jesus, Jesus. go. Go. All right, come on out in the name of Jesus. You spirits that came in through words spoken in anger, through words spoken in anger, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I command you right now. In the power of Jesus' name, through words spoken in anger in the name of Jesus, through words spoken in retaliation, I command to go. Through words spoken against us in thoughtlessness in the name of Jesus, I command to go. Through words spoken out of hatred in somebody else's heart, I command you to go in the name of Jesus. Words spoken in jealousy, imprecations spoken in jealousy and envy, I command you to go in the name of Jesus. Jealousy and envy and hatred, I command you to go right now. We break those bondages. We break those curses right now in the power of Jesus' name. In the power of Jesus' name. In the power of Jesus' name. Every one of you must go right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You know, there's a lot of things that we've learned through our years in the ministry of deliverance. And we we begun to see that a lot of people didn't get real freedom because some of these things that we're dealing with today never were really dealt with. The person couldn't understand, well, I went through deliverance and I, I never did get real freedom. We're dealing with some root things. We're dealing with some real basic issues here today. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen, Lord. Praise God. Lord, you just show us your way. That's right. All of your spirits must continue to come out in the name of Jesus. Let's come out. All of those curses, all those imprecation curses are broken in the power of Jesus' name. In the power of Jesus' name, we are free. We are free in the power of the blood of Jesus. In the power of the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. In the Spirit, I see spirits of division within families. Family division spirits. Uh, Divorce. Separation. Some of the situations hadn't come to divorce, but divorce has been talked. Separation, argument, debate, divisiveness. See, the enemy is a master trying to tear up and wreck our families and our homes. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, our homes and families are salvaged. Our homes and families are made strong in the power of Jesus' name. In the power of Jesus' name. Now, you demons, you've been listening. And you know we're talking about you, and you already you're afraid. You're already excited. Because you've been working discard in some of these lives, in some of these family situations, between husbands and wives. And you've brought in hurts. They're spirits of hurt. Because you have been instrumental in bringing hurts into people's lives through unkind words and unkind deeds, hurtful things. In the name of Jesus, your spirits of family discord, Family discord. You work against the unity of the family. You work against the unity in the relationship of husband and wives. Some of you spirits promote petty things. Petty things. Petty things in the name of Jesus. And I stand against you devils in the power of the authority of Jesus' name. You old home-wrecking spirits. You old home-disturbing spirits. 
you devils that come against the welfare of our families and our homes and our home relationships, we stand together against you as one man today. We're in agreement against you, devil. We don't want any part of you. We're not going to have any part of you. In the name of Jesus, now start coming out. Start coming out. Come begin, begin to move. Now, in the name of Jesus. Now, go in the power of Jesus' name. We call the destroyer of the family Christian. All right. In the name of Jesus. 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 You demons that come against the family heads. You destroy of the family priest. In the name of Jesus. I command you to go. You are a destroyer of the family priesthood. And I command you to go in the name of Jesus. You attack the headship in these families. And I command you to release God's people right now. In the name of Jesus. Spirits of separation. Spirits of divorce. Spirits of argument, debate, and strife. I command you to go in the name of Jesus. Spirits of disunity. Discord in the name of Jesus. I command you go in the name of Jesus. Go now in the name of Jesus. That's right. Let's get after them. Let's get after them. Don't be embarrassed to enter in on this. If you feel the need of it and the place for it, really enter in. Breathe those things out. Know that they're real. Be free of those things. Ha! In the name of Jesus. Come on out. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I command you to go. You old spirits of Jezebel, I command you to come on out right now in the name of Jesus. You old Jezebel-influenced spirits, I command you to go. I command you to go. You are a usurper of authority. You are a usurper of authority within the family in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, and I command you to go. I command you to go right now in the power of Jesus' name. In the power of Jesus' name. Hallelujah. We're free of you. We are rid of you right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. There are more of you family spirits. Spirits of divorce and separation and contention and strife. Heartache. Disappointment in the name of Jesus. Somebody in the family has brought deep disappointment to you. And shame in the name of Jesus. You spirits of disappointment and shame, I command you to go now in the name of Jesus. Go now in the name of Jesus. All spirits of deep disappointment and shame, I command you, spirits of family shame, family shame and family embarrassment, in the name of Jesus, I command you to go now in the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right? You got Jezebel, let's get Ahab now, in the name of Jesus. That's right. You old weak, you old weak headship spirit, in the name of Jesus, I command you to go. In the name of Jesus, you spirit of weak headship, I command you to go. Hallelujah. Men, God wants us to be the priest and the leader in our families, in the name of Jesus. That's the role that He's given to us. We must be strong to fulfill God's commission to us. Maybe the Lord let me preach on that a little fuller. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Spirits of idolatry. When I command them to come out, you're going to stand against them in your spirit and in your will. You're going to say, you're not going to stay in me. You're going to come out of me. In the name of Jesus, I address myself to every one of you filthy devils of idolatry. Some of you we have discussed today, and others of you we haven't even touched on. But you are there, and you're going to come out of God's people. And we're going to be free, and we're going to meet God's conditions for our healing and for our deliverance. In the name of Jesus, spirits of idolatry begin to come up. That's right. In the name of Jesus, you're going to manifest yourself, and you're going to come out right now. In the name of Jesus. That's right. Begin to move right now. In the power of Jesus' name. In the power of Jesus' name, spirits of idolatry all over this room, come on out right now. In Jesus' name, go! Go, you spirits of religious idolatry. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, by the power of the blood of Jesus, by the power of the name of Jesus, spirits of idolatry, you Christian idolatry, in the name of Jesus, I command you to go right now in the power of the blood of Jesus, in the power of the blood of Jesus. We shall know the truth, and the truth shall make us free. Come on out of us, every one of you. Come on out. Go now. Go now. Bring all your companions, all your roots go. In the authority of Jesus' name. In the authority of Jesus' name. In the authority of Jesus' name. By the power of the blood of Jesus. Come on out. Come on out right now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Spirits of idolatry. Family idolatry. In the name of Jesus. Family idolatry spirits. Come on out. You pass down in the families. Come on out right now. Out of each one here in the name of Jesus. Spirits of idolatry, come out in the name of Jesus. 
in the name of Jesus, religious idolatry, in the name of Jesus. Demons that have come in through so-called Jesus pictures, come in through crosses and doves and other objects. In the name of Jesus, I command you to go. We release ourselves from this. We release ourselves from these curses in the power of the blood of Jesus. In the power of the blood of Jesus. In the authority of the shed blood of Jesus. Every spirit of idolatry is cursed and it must go now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. By the power of Jesus' name. By the power of Jesus' name. All spirits that have come in through tradition, through ungodly tradition, other than the traditions of God, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, you spirits of religious tradition and family tradition and man-made tradition, we cast you out and we command you to go. Go now in the name of Jesus. Go now in the name of Jesus. Go now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah to the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. We're free from the bondage of tradition. Free from the bondage of tradition. Free from its financial burdens. Free from its heathen practices. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. You old devils associated with all of those heathen gods. I command you to go from all those gods and goddesses. I curse you in the name of Jesus. And defeat you in the power of that blood. And I command you to release God's people right now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, all demons associated with pierced ears, I command you to go in the name of Jesus, you idolatrous devils. You go and you lift off of them that oppression. You take those physical infirmities and spiritual problems out of their lives. Right now, in the power of Jesus' name, in the power of Jesus' name, we curse you in the authority of Jesus' name. We command you to go right now in His name. In His name, all pierced ear spirits, go now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we are not in bondage to any idol. We're not in bondage to any man. We break all the bondage from those who have pierced those ears. In the name of Jesus, we break the curses. We break the bondages in the power of Jesus' name. And we set the captives free. Right now, in the name of Jesus. Right now, in the name of Jesus. By the power of the blood of Jesus. By the power of the precious name of Jesus. We are set free. We are set free right now. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, every spirit that has come in through abortion, in the name of Jesus, I command it to go through agreement with abortion. In the name of Jesus, I command all spirits of abortion and murder to go. In the name of Jesus, because I've thought of it, because I've agreed with it, because I've practiced it, it makes no difference. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we've had men delivered from spirits of abortion because they were participants. In a woman having had an abortion, they may have gotten a woman pregnant and, and paid for the abortion and agreed with it and set it up. So men, don't discount yourself on this. In the name of Jesus, anyone that has agreed with it needs to have God's forgiveness and needs to be set free. We command all such spirits to keep coming out of us in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus and all spirits of lust and oral sex and perverseness and homosexuality and lesbianism. And all of that has to go. It's garbage. And we set our breath free from it in the name of Jesus. By the power of the precious name of Jesus. By the power of the precious blood of Jesus. Hallelujah to the cross. Hallelujah to the name of Jesus our Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Mm-hmm. We found it. Mm-hmm. I said we have found it. Problems with it. Mm hmm. Praying hands. Anybody got anything else Pray you want to just get rid of? I'll collect it up. Brother, brother, he's a collector here. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Take care of your own things. You're responsible. And be sure that you're acting on your conviction and not somebody else's. Don't act on my conviction. If you're not convinced and convicted about what I'm saying today, don't be condemned about it, but be open and say, God, I want you to show me the truth of what I've heard today. I welcome that. If it's truth, God's Spirit will bear witness. The Holy Spirit will confirm it. And the Lord will show you. I realize some of the things that I've said today are difficult for some people to accept the moment that they hear it. But remember that when we hear truth, don't just put it on the shelf and forget about it. You just put it on the shelf long enough to where you know the truth of God about it. So those of us that have been in, in deliverance and experience in that, we don't have any problems with this, but people that hear it for the first time, they say, well, I want to hear that again. I want to know a little more about that. And I'm not going to condemn you for that. Not at all. 
Because I tell you, like I said a while ago, it wasn't all easy for me. I, I, had, to, I had to pray through on some of it. <laughs> God began to deal with me about it. But I know the peace that comes with it. I know the joy and the rest that comes at the end of the trail when we've done these things. See, the things that I'm talking about, they do not increase the spiritual value of any Christian's life. The only area that they can possibly minister to you in is the area of your flesh and your soulish nature. That's all it can do. If you're going to give a witness as a Christian, you don't need some ornament on you. We witness to Christ by the character of our life and not by some emblem that we wear with on our bodies. Let, let them see Jesus in you. I was just reminded that birthstones come from uh, 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 astrology and come from the Middle Ages through witchcraft. Bir birthstones are associated with witchcraft and astrology. Amen. That's right. True. I didn't cover it all, Glenn. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Is there anything else in this area of spirits that any of you have identified with that, that you said, well, well, maybe some others have this? This problem in the areas of idolatry and those things we've talked about today. And tattoos? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. There's some things I don't understand about tattoos, but the Scripture forbids in the Old Testament and the Old Mosaic Law forbidden to mutilate the body or to mark the body. The Amplified Translation uses the word tattoos. I don't know how to explain this, but I found two people with extensive tattoos on their body, which I could not affect any deliverance for. And they repented of it, and they did everything they knew to make a condition. But they had very extensive tattoos. Now, whether that had anything to do with it exactly or not, I don't know. But I do know that we have ministered to people with minor tattoos, and spirits associated with them have come out. You had something else? Yes. When you were talking about the piercing of the ears, why the Lord took me to the tattoos that I had. Yes. All right. That's true. All right. Maybe several have tattoos. Sometimes there, there is some demon association because of what is tattooed. You know, sometimes there's bondages, particular bondages, like a man will have a girl's name, a sweetheart's name, something like that tattooed on his body, and he end up marrying somebody else. That's a little embarrassing, I guess. Yeah. And uh, maybe has a has a picture that's, that's not too nice, or, or a serpent. A lot of tattoos are in the forms of, of serpents and things like that, which represents Satan and his kingdom. Maybe we better cover that for the sake of you that have tattoos on your body. All right, bondage to the person, just like the piercing of the ears, true, a bondage to the person who, who ministered the tattoo. Is this in the area of tattoos or something like that? Now, he's, he's scared up on Booger. Now, I didn't mention that, did I? Now, he scared this one up. All I can tell you is what we have done personally. You know, in the Old Testament, they mention the... Uh, Teraphim, a teraphim were household gods, and they were the images of dead ancestors. And uh, in our home, my wife had pictures of, of her parents who were deceased and others. And the Lord convicted us that that was really in the vein of the teraphim and household gods. And so those things were removed. God convicted us to do it. So we've removed photographs and things like that also from our house. We don't have any representation of man or birds or animals or beasts at all. That's what we have done. If we've gone beyond what God requires, well, I'd rather do that than to fall this short of what God requires. That's kind of the way I feel about it. So, again, let, let the Lord show you areas here. All right, I want to call for these spirits of tattoo. Can I do that? All right. Yes, just pierced earrings. I have never found any association with the clip-on uh, type of ear uh, pieces except in instances where they might be the... Uh, associated with something heathenistic or idolatrous, some symbol like that, but not, not in them at all, just as in the pierced earrings. Well, that's not across the board. We'll talk about that. All right, in the name of Jesus, let's deal with these spirits of tattoos for the men that have had these, maybe a few ladies. In the name of Jesus, we come against every spirit of tattoo and we break the curse of it. We break every association with them because of the nature and the... Uh, diagram of that tattoo in the name of Jesus. We command them in His name to go. We cast you out right now in Jesus' name. Go, you spirits associated with those tattoos. We command you, come out now in the name of Jesus. Come on out now in the name of Jesus. Turn Him loose right now in the power and the authority of Jesus' name. By the power of the blood of Jesus. By the power of the blood of Jesus. By the power of the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, by the power of Jesus' name. Come on out, all spirits, all spirits associated with those tattoos, we command you to go right now in the name of Jesus. That's right, let him go. 
Come on out of him. You have no right to him. The curse is broken off of him right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I have a six forty star on my arm that I put on when I was just a little boy. I show you in ignorance what you can do. And this never come to light to me until about a year ago. Brother Dr. Dabbs, I, I had a and a seminar with him. Uh, he also brought up the Indian jewelry he was talking about. I make Indian jewelry and it taught me a lot of things not to make, you know, and I don't make them. Praise the Lord. But this is a six pointy star. It's two triangles. That's the way I put it on there when I was a little boy. I drew two triangles, and then I, I took a carbine out of a dry cell flashlight battery and with, with needle put that in my arm. Hmm. My daddy, I thought, was going to beat me to death, but it's hmm. in there, see? It's a six-pointed star. And the only way it can be took out of there unless God removes it is cut it out. And the power of it is broken. And the power of it is broken Amen. down. Praise Amen. God. Amen. Praise the Lord. But you see, I've had this since a little boy. Just a, just a small, little, dumb boy. Let me lead you in this deliverance prayer, and then I want you to begin to call those spirits out of yourself. All right, say with me. Lord Jesus, I love you, and I know you love me. Lord, you have saved me and redeemed me by your blood. I belong to you. I desire to live for you and to glorify your name. I am through with the devil. All of his ways. I take back all of the ground that I ever yielded to him. And I purpose to live for you. You have forgiven me of all my sins. I forgive every person that has ever trespassed against me. I forgive them now and ask you to forgive them too. Lord, I come to you as my deliverer. I ask you to set me free. Your word promised me, whoever calls upon your name shall be delivered. I call upon you now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Deliver me and set me free. Amen. All right, now you just move right into your deliverance. And if you feel like you need help, if there's some of you here that you haven't been through all the teaching and emphasis, then, then just let somebody come in and help you. Just show a hand, and Brother George is here, and Brother Glenn, and whether David's around somewhere, I guess. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. All right, you spirits, you must obey. You must obey. You're being renounced. That's the way to do it. That's the way to do it. In the name of Jesus. You must obey in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, by the power of the blood of Jesus, by the power of the blood of Jesus. Well, just say, I renounce you, or I, I don't want you in me, and you just have to come out of me in the name of Jesus. You know, praise, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's great. That's good. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. That's right. Receive your deliverance. Receive your deliverance right now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, by the power of Jesus' name, by the power of Jesus' name, I command you right now, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord, praise the Lord, all of you demons are fleeing, all you demons of fear and doubt, all you spirits of infirmity, all of you, in the name of Jesus, those that have been named and those that are now being named and renounced, we command you, go in the power of Jesus' name, go in the power of Jesus' name. Go in the power of Jesus' name, by the power and authority of the blood of Jesus. By the power and authority of the blood of Jesus. We command you to go now in Jesus' name. Go now in Jesus' name. Go now, right now, in the name of Jesus, by the power of His blood. By the power of His blood. That's right. All the way out. All the way out. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. That's right. Keep coming out. Keep coming out of Him all the way. All the way. Uh, what's, what's your boat's name? Stop him. Scott, Scott, all right, you doing okay? All right. Now, if any of these spirits, you know, they, before they, some of them have tried to take you over and take your power away from you. Some of them have tried to take you out of control where you couldn't control them. Now, see, you, you stand against them and do not permit them to do that to you. So you have to take you over and control you, control your body where you don't have control of it. 
if any of you tried to do that, you just say, you can't do that to me. Just keep talking to us and announcing that you got it to come out here and do that to you. Okay? All right. Carry on. Praise the Lord. All right. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. In the name of Jesus. That's right. You demons are defeated out of our lives, and we purpose that we will have no other spirit in us other than God's Holy Spirit. Every spirit other than God's Holy Spirit, you must go from us in the power of Jesus' name. Every unclean spirit, every foul, demon, evil power must leave our lives and our bodies right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And my son just now, as I was with you, thank you, Jesus. Said his ears started hurting violently. Amen. All right. right. In the name of Jesus, we break that inheritance. We break that inheritance curse off of my brother's ears in the power of Jesus' name. And the demon of deafness must go. You must go. Demon of deafness, I command you, go in the name of Jesus. By the power of the blood of Jesus. By the power of the blood of Jesus. That's right. Deafness goes off of these ears right now in Jesus' name, and you will not pass down to the son or any other member of the family. You are aborted, and you must go right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now, Lord, heal and repair all the damage that's been done to this ear and restore it and heal it completely, Lord, for the glory of your name. We thank you in Jesus' name. All right, just keep on now. Some of them are asking for some ministries, and I'm going to be involved in, in helping some individuals, and others of you need help. Now, don't hesitate to, to let somebody help you. Let's minister to one another. Those of you that's had experience in deliverance, uh, begin to help one another. And let's minister. Let's have a little body ministry going on here. All right? So I'm going to be involved here for a while in ministering to some others. So you just hang in there. <laughs> Amen. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home.